It's good to see all of you in my mind's eye. I'm grateful to the program committee for allowing me to present to you. I have 20 minutes to convince you John Florio may not have written the 1620 translation of Decameron, that it may instead have been the Earl of Oxford, and that Oxford also wrote the works of Shakespeare. Simple, right? So let me just note that my 20 years of research into the authorship debate as a psychoanalyst has convinced me that the traditional theory that Shakespeare of Stratford wrote the works <clears throat> is based primarily on tradition and on a stubborn refusal even to consider the possibility that Shakespeare might be a pen name in an age of literary anonymity. If I succeed in whetting your appetite to investigate this further, you will find my longer essay on this topic on my Georgetown University faculty website. 2020 will be remembered for the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, but it also marked the 400th anniversary of the first full English translation of Boccaccio's Decameron, a book set in Florence in 1348 during Europe's Black Death, the deadliest plague in human history, which may have killed three-fourths of the population of Florence. So it is timely to take a fresh look at that influential but anonymous translation. Decameron was entered into the Catholic Church's first Counter-Reformation Index of Banned Books in 1559. Lynn Westwater tells me this made it a bestseller. In 1582, Leonardo Salviati published a new bodlerized edition that returned Decameron into the Church's good graces through deleting its more offensive material. In Salviati's version, more than half of the 100 stories were altered significantly. One can imagine the tension between the fame of this book on the one hand and its power to offend the church with its relentless anti-clericalism. Although Decameron was translated into several languages by 1500, its first full English translation only appeared anonymously in 1620. However, the printer John Wolfe entered some version of it into the stationer's register in 1587. That was in the height of the euphuous literary movement. Its patron was the Earl of Oxford. Scholars such as Donatella Montini have emphasized the euphuistic style of this translation. Montini is among those who have noted that the anonymous translator often doubled nouns and adjectives from the original Italian. Hendiatus is more characteristic of Shakespeare than of any other early modern English writer. Further, there are striking textual connections with phrases from Shakespeare's works. I would propose that this 1587 version of Decameron was the basis for the 1620 translation. It was published by Isaac Jaggard in two lavish folio volumes with dozens of woodcut illustrations. It was dedicated to Philip, Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery, one of the two dedicatees of Shakespeare's first folio, also published by Jaggard three years later in 1623. Montgomery's wife was Oxford's daughter, Susan Vere, and she may well have been the owner of the manuscript of this translation as well as of the 18 unpublished Shakespeare play manuscripts that first appeared in the first folio. Guida Armstrong cites Edwin Willoughby's 1932 speculation that, quote, it was the success of Decameron that encouraged the Jaggards to try their luck with Shakespeare's first folio. Herbert Wright was the first to attribute the 1620 translation to John Florio. He writes that, quote, the translator's master of Italian was not complete. The inaccuracy of the English translator is a serious defect and so is his diffuseness. Through meticulous scholarship, Wright concluded that the anonymous translator used both Salviati as well as Antoine Masson's French translation. Wright was also intimately familiar with Florio's 1603 translation of Montaigne's essays. Wright methodically developed a profile of numerous characteristics he found in the anonymous translator based on changes made to the Italian and French texts. Quote, in addition to his competence in both French and Italian, he manifests a special interest in dogs and horses, the sea, the law, drama, and fine arts and music, and a courtly relish for ceremony and rank. <laughs>
While many of those qualities describe Oxford, Douglas Bush and his review of Wright's book does not agree with Wright that they describe Florio. It is instructive that Wright's methodology for identifying an unknown author resembles J. Thomas Looney's 1920 profile that first suggested Oxford as Shakespeare. We might compare Wright's findings with several of Looney's relevant characteristics of the author of Shakespeare's works. He was eccentric and mysterious, unconventional, an enthusiast for Italy, a follower of sport, an enthusiast in the world of drama, a lover of music, a member of the higher aristocracy, and a lyric poet of recognized talent. Oxford had some personal experience with outbreaks of plague, the year after his father died in 1562, and he began living with the future Lord Burley, London experienced an epidemic that killed as many as 25% of its inhabitants. So, the loss of Oxford's father was shortly followed by the deaths of a quarter of the population of his new home of London. Once again, in the years 1585 to 87, England suffered another plague outbreak, which may have reminded Oxford of those earlier times in his life. In Oxford's day, Decameron was the best-known book about living through a plague. Armstrong states that an anonymous translation was unusual in 1620. She finds Wright's influential attribution of it to Florio, quote, problematic since she believes Florio would have signed the translation were it his. So, a word about early modern anonymous publication. Marcy North, who has done seminal work on this topic, warns us that we suffer from some unscholarly prejudices about anonymous works. For example, quote, scholars have traditionally preferred works with known authors, and anonymous works are assumed to be, quote, far inferior to those of known authors. One cannot help but thinking of a parallel with the stigma of illegitimate birth. North concludes that scholars dislike an authorship vacuum and that once it is filled with a speculative attribution, scholars may move on without closely re-examining the accuracy of that initial authorship attribution. Wright admitted he was uncertain of his attribution to Florio, but in the years since, it is often treated as established fact hanging onto the translation like barnacles. One thing Florio does have in his favor for having translated Boccaccio is his last name. However, it has created some misunderstandings. Yes, his parents were Italian immigrants to England, and yes, he wrote an Italian English dictionary. But no, he never set foot in Italy. Oxford, by contrast, lived in Italy for a year and set one-third of Shakespeare's plays there. Armstrong observes, quote, The 1620 edition is unusual among Boccaccio's works in English translation in that there is absolutely no indication of the identity of the translator. There have been no other anonymous works later attributed to Florio. Armstrong notes the paradox that Florio would have concealed his role in translating this book when he took credit for his highly regarded 1603 translation of Montaigne. Douglas Bush is also ambivalent about Wright's attribution of the translation to Florio, wondering if Wright developed his list of parallel characteristics in the anonymous translator and in Florio, because he had already chosen Florio. This would illustrate the cognitive pitfall of confirmation and bias when we unconsciously pay more attention to pieces of evidence that support our pre-existing assumptions. Bush gives the example of Florio's translation of Montaigne being moralistic, but he does not find an equivalently moralistic strain in the Boccaccio translation. Now, for those of you who may have heard only slanders about Oxford and his supporters, I would ask you to examine what was written about Oxford in the centuries before he was proposed as the author of Shakespeare's works a century ago. Since 1920, Shakespeare scholars have circled their ranks in belittling Oxford's 20 or so signed poems. Before 1920, Oxford was criticized for his fickle head and his violent and perverse temper, but he received nothing but glowing praise for his literary works. 
As early as 1589, Oxford was acclaimed as one of the best of Elizabeth's courtier poets and an excellent author of comedies who preferred to write, wait for it, anonymously. He was a generous patron of other writers and composers, and an unusually high proportion of the 33 works dedicated to him by other writers were literary rather than devotional in nature. I believe that attributing both the Shakespeare canon and the Decameron translation to Oxford is the most parsimonious way of accounting for the historical and literary evidence. In a 2019 study, Melissa Walter shows that a large number of Shakespeare's plays, and especially his comic heroines, were shaped by Italian novellas, particularly Decameron. Wright speaks of the problem of Shakespeare's knowledge of Boccaccio, that is, how he was familiar with tales in Decameron that had not yet been translated into English, but were used in plays such as Cymbeline. Oxford's knowledge of Italian and French, his year living in Italy, his interest in translations in general, in personally financing translations of works by Italian authors, and his interest in literary classics are all consistent with his having undertaken this translation. Most notably, the translator's use of anonymity is fully consistent with Oxford's recognized pattern of concealing his authorship of many of his works. In March of 1620, the Archbishop Bishop of Canterbury denied permission for the Decameron translation's publication. Later that year, however, the book did find its way into print. The translation appeared in further editions in 1625, 1634, 1657, and 1684, attesting to its popularity. Changes in the text, such as its full moralizing tone, were presumably required to guess, get past the archbishop's censorship. I think it is likely that whether or not he collaborated on the 1587 version of this translation, it was Anthony Munday who bolderized Oxford's 1587 manuscript sufficiently to overcome the objections of the Archbishop of Canterbury. The wording of the 1620 dedication asserts that the book, with the Earl of Montgomery as patron, will, quote, be safely shielded from foul-mouthed slander and detraction. Strikingly, the phrase foul-mouthed slander and detraction also appears word for word in the dedication of Monday, 16. 18 Sidero Triambos, and these are the only two books in Ebo that contain that phrase. So, I would speculate that as one of Oxford's former literary secretaries, Monday wrote the 1620 dedication. Monday also dedicated his 1618 translation of books three and four of Amadis of Gaul to the Earl of Montgomery with wording that, as Armstrong observes, is also similar to that of the 1620 translation. Since Monday signed his other translations, I assume the anonymity of the 1620 Decameron implies Monday was not its sole translator. The Oxford Dictionary of National Biography asserts that, quote, in the late 1580s and 1590s, particularly, Monday functioned single-handedly as a major translation factory translating works into English from French, Italian, and Spanish. It may seem surprising that so many years elapsed between Oxford's putative translation of this work by 1587 and its publication only in 1620, but recall that Shakespeare's As You Like It, for example, was first entered into the Stationer's Register in 1600, yet was not published for 23 years. In fact, half the plays in the first folio were written by the time of Oxford's death in 1604, but remained unpublished until 1623. More research is needed on why that was. What else may have appealed to Oxford about translating this work? We know that Oxford devoted much of his career to establishing English as a respected literary language at a time when few Europeans knew English. Given his interests, he knew that just as Dante and Petrarch made the vulgar language of Italian as respectable as Latin for poetry, so Boccaccio did the same for Italian for works of prose. Ovid was one of Oxford's models for 
models for poetry, Boccaccio may have been such a model for literary prose. For Oxford, translations were an important means of making foreign texts widely accessible to English readers, for honing his writing skills, and for enriching the English language in the process. A close reading of the 1620 translation offers repeated parallels with Oxford's other works in word coinages, occasional parallels with his own life, quirky spellings, and phrases that are also found in works signed by Shakespeare. Oxford loved to coin words, but also to turn nouns into verbs, to noun verbs, and to give old words new meanings. My longer essay gives many examples of newly coined and newly defined words in the Decameron translation. I am struck by the likelihood that the same anonymous author who used the trope, his hair stood up right like porcupine's quill, also, as Shakespeare had the ghost in Hamlet say, I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul and make each particular hair to stand on end like quills on the fretful porcupine. Caroline Spurgeon wrote that, quote, Shakespeare's intense interest in the human face has never, I think, been adequately noticed. In particular, she cogently highlighted the many ways that Shakespeare was deeply fascinated with outward expressions of a character's inner emotions. Although Spurgeon seems to have overlooked this example, this example, what a vivid image of fright. The OED gives the first use of the meaning as overplus, as superabundance, in Shakespeare's sonnet 135. Thou hast thy will and will to boot and will in overplus. So, superabundant will or libido. And Philippa, in this translation, uses that word in just the same sense. In the seventh story of day six, she argues that she never refused to have sex with her husband, but her libido is stronger than his. She then asks the judge, quote, what should I do with the overplus remaining in mine own power and whereof he had no need? In the fourth story of day five, we find the familiar phrase, there shall we hear the sweet bird sing, recalling the phrase I just emphasized in The Rape of Lucrece, as well as where late the sweet bird sang in Sonnet 73 and the sweet birds, oh, how they sing in the winter's tale. In Ebo, the only other time we hear sweet birds sing is in a poem subscribed, Ignoto, known since 1921 to be another of Oxford's pseudonyms. The ninth story of day three is recognized as a source for all's well that ends well. In his translation, Oxford emphasizes a parallel with his own life. The Italian version said, Morto il conte e lui nelle mani, del re lasciato, or once the count his father died, he was left in the hands of the king. And Masson wrote the same in his French translation. But Oxford translates this as, old count Isnard dying, young Bertrand fell as a ward to the king. Just as Oxford became the first royal ward in Elizabeth's new wardship system after the 16th Earl Conte in Italian died in 1562. Oxford's guardian, later to become his father-in-law, was the future Lord Burley. Later in the story, the Italian version has the king say to Beltramo, Beltramo, voi siete o mai grande e fornito. Beltramo, you are henceforth great and provided. Once more, Oxford's longer English translation introduces a key autobiographical word, quote, Noble Count, it is not unknown to us that you are a gentleman of great honor, and it is our royal pleasure to discharge your wardship. And this is the only instance of discharge your wardship in Ebo. It is likely that Oxford, whose own wardship was discharged when he turned 21, thus drew attention to a pivotal parallel with his life not only because he identified with Beltramo, whom he called Bertrand, but because he wished at least some readers of his manuscript translation would recognize this parallel with his life. To conclude, I would suggest that we have failed to give Oxford credit for the full range of his brilliant literary creativity, and I hope other scholars will further investigate his possible role in translating to Cameron.